Many years ago, I discovered card magic and I spent many weeks learning various tricks and techniques. After a while, however, I came to realize that magic is very, especially card magic, strict in terms of steps and sequences. For example, I learned many, many tricks for which you had to prepare the cards in some way, separate them from half black, half red, uh, put the cards in a particular order or some of them in a particular order, prepare the four aces on top of the deck, for example. So if people wanted to mix the cards before I performed, I would have to say no in uh, the most innocent way possible. And I felt this was very restrictive. What I came to discover was that it's possible to improvise with card magic. So what I did was create uh, the idea, the illusion that I was performing a trick, whereas in reality, I had no idea how it was going to begin, what was going to occur, and how it would end. And after doing this for a few weeks and months, I realized that there were actually three processes involved in card magic. The first is the selection of a card. The second is losing the card and telling the story, the actual event. And the third final part is the discovery or revelation of the card. And once I realized these three sections to card magic, these three compartments or boxes, as I now call them, everything fell into place and I was able to fill up each box with stuff, with ideas and with knowledge. I was able to, for example, realize what makes me uh, operate naturally, what I like to do the most, particular stories I may have told. Even though I was improvising, what I was actually doing was mixing and matching different techniques from the box of selecting a card, from the box of the actual process of losing the card and telling a story, and then the third box of revealing or discovering the card in some way, finding it somewhere. So once each of these three boxes were filled, and they became more and more filled as weeks and months passed, and as I gained more and more experience, I actually became, dare I say it, very able to overcome any difficulty. And the reason I could do that is because I was not prepared for anything, which actually means that I was prepared for everything. So I was prepared by not being prepared for one particular thing. This meant that as I approached a table, I didn't know if the people, if anyone was a magician already, that happened once or twice, if they knew a magician, if they had any experience of card magic, if there was, uh, sometimes I heard that there was a magician at a wedding, for example, or a work party, a Christmas party. So some people had experience of magicians and they could even remember one or two tricks whereas other people had only seen magic on TV. Some people didn't even believe that magic was true. And of course, magic doesn't necessarily exist in the same way as it does in the Harry Potter world, for example. But they didn't believe that it was possible to perform magic, in inverted commas, uh, in front of people without, the, without cam camera trickery or some kind of editing for TV. They didn't believe it was actually possible to do it without using something fake. So it was very satisfying for me to be able to achieve an effect using just a normal packet of cards and following the, the three-step process of selection, losing, and discovery. So because I didn't know what was going to happen at the table, I, I didn't know what was going to happen in the beginning. I didn't know how a card was going to be selected. Maybe somebody dropped the card. Maybe somebody took a card on their own without me asking them to, in which case I would just go with that. I'd say, okay, you, you selected that card. Let's, let's try and do something with that and see what happens, you know. And then maybe I would actually get a glimpse of that card and know what it is, but they wouldn't know that, or I wouldn't. So by not being prepared for anything and not having any expectations, I was actually able to achieve more. And then in the revelation and the actual process before the revelation, not knowing what was going to happen, not knowing what I was going to say, made the effect even more powerful, even for me sometimes, because sometimes they would mix the cards themselves. And if, for example, I happened to know what the card was because I saw it or I cheated and I looked at it in a secret way using one of a few techniques I know, I was uh, 
I was uh, able to notice that, for example, they had mixed the cards themselves and just by chance they had mixed their card unknowingly to the top or the bottom of the deck. So when they gave me the cards back from having mixed, I would have a quick look without them noticing and I would say to myself and I would notice, wow, they just mixed their own card to the bottom or the top of the deck or even the second position from the top or the bottom. So sometimes chance was on my side and actually more often than not it's quite remarkable really you can even test this yourself if you just name any card and mix a deck of cards there's quite a high chance that your card will be near the top or near the bottom so it's easy to get hold of and even if it's exactly in the middle it's still possible to quickly and secretly cut the cards in half and put the top half underneath which will bring the card if it were in the middle to almost the top or almost the bottom. So a card is always very accessible. So what I've done, what I've discovered and what I've realized is that this process can also be applied to playing the piano. And in this podcast, I'm going to explain how that's possible. Once you have the idea in your mind and the boxes to fill, you'll actually see the piano and play the piano and even perform in a very different way, in a better way. So first of all, there are also three boxes this is not always the case there may be something where there are five or only two but for card magic there are three selecting the card losing the card and finding the card that's all there is to it and then you fill those boxes with ways to select a card ways to lose a card and tell a story and ways to find the card it could appear in their hand because you switched it earlier it could appear in their bag it could be a mind reading revelation because you happen to know what the card is already many many different ways and it's exactly the same for the piano. So I'm going to tell you what the boxes are and then we're going to discuss each box. And I think you'll find this very useful and interesting and quite insightful, not to mention philosophical. The first box is the mental box. The second box is the physical box, which involves primarily the fingers and your posture. And the third box, which is actually the least important in piano, is the theory box, the knowledge box. The order of these boxes, just like in card magic, cannot be uh, modified. The order for card magic has to be selection, losing, and finding. You can't find a card if there wasn't a card selected first, you understand? And it's the same for the piano. Now, let me just go into a little bit more detail in that. If we began with the final box theory, it wouldn't enable us to play the piano. The body follows the mind. This is a fact known by most people. So that's why the mind must be the primary focus before you even sit at your piano. We're going to discuss what's involved in that box in just a moment. If you want to know what an orange tastes like, you can read 10,000 words about that. But no amount of words is going to replace the act of eating an orange. It's exactly the same for the piano. You can read everything on Wikipedia, in all the books possible, and listen to all the lessons from your teachers and put all of that knowledge in box three, but it will not in any way affect the mentality of box one or the physical ability of box two. So that's why we begin with the mind in the mental box, which feeds the physical box, and that is your identity. That's your, that is how you play the piano. And the third box is kind of floating on its own separately. That's just the knowledge box, whose content is not actually important to the way that you play the piano. So looking at the first box, the mental box, this involves philosophies. This involves notions and concepts of playing the piano before you even sit at it and before you learn anything about it, before you discover your fingering natural, uh, your natural fingering abilities and before you start reading knowledge just to satisfy your ego. The mental box involves my whole philosophy of water pianism as well as discovering your musical personality. On my blog, I have an article entitled Musical Personality, and I also have a video on the same subject, which is made available on my YouTube channel and is also linked to from that particular blog article. Understanding certain things about playing the piano will put you in the correct mind frame to enable box two, your physical abilities, to, to be as honest as possible, to be true and to be real. To be playing as somebody else. To be trying to attain the ability of somebody else is very, very much the wrong way to go because everybody's different. There must be 
100 million piano players in the world, surely more. Not one of them is the same as any other because they all have different experiences. This is some philosophy to go into box one. They all have different experiences. They all have different reasons and purposes. They all have different needs. Their musical personalities are different. They enjoy different sounds. They have uh, a different reason to play the piano. Some, some may be personal. Uh, some maybe don't even have a reason at all. They just enjoy doing it. They couldn't even tell you in words why they enjoy it. So there are so many different possibilities that it's impossible to discuss them all. This is one of the first things to realize that you are unique and that everything in your mental box is unique to you. So it's unnecessary to compare yourself to other pianists. And the same goes for box two, the physical way that you play the piano, your fingering, your posture will probably be different to, the, to a vast majority of people. Your hand is different. The length of your fingers is different. Your wrist position is different. Your height is different. Your arm length is different. Everything is different. So comparison is futile. So the first philosophical point is to realize that you're individual and that comparisons with others is completely useless. And it actually may cause a frustration, which is negative. You may feel frustrated that you're unable to achieve what somebody else has achieved. But you must realize that there, there must be something that you can do that somebody else can't yet do. So it just becomes a big circle of unnecessary worrying. So relax. In the philosophical box, you also need to realize a few things about the piano itself. There are no black and white notes on the piano, and no key is more difficult or easy than another key. The reason there are no black and white notes is because if the whole piano were painted the colors of the rainbow, the whole range of the light spectrum, you would still be able to play it. The two black notes as they are now, and the three black notes, that pattern of two and three, two and three, would still exist. The shape of the white notes would still exist. Everything would be the same. So in other words, there are no black and white notes. And it's incorrect to say black note, white note, black key, white key. Absolutely incorrect. By saying that no key is more complicated than another, that's simply because each key, and there are 12 keys, has its own major scale. And a major scale itself is built from the template of half steps and whole steps, or whole tones and half tones, which is each individual note, a half tone, and two notes, it's a whole tone or a whole step. Uh, the major scale is built 12 times based on the template of whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. So to say that one major scale is more or less complicated than the other one, just because it's more or less common, is quite ridiculous because they are exactly the same thing. Just seven notes based on whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half steps or tones, as you wish. Once you remove the concept and the belief and the idea that a key like F sharp or B or A is complicated, the piano suddenly becomes a more accessible instrument to you. And you actually put yourself above others who do give themselves the limitation of playing in more difficult keys. It truly doesn't matter at all. So a combination of your musical personality and identifying sounds that you like, reasons for playing the piano, the kind of pianist that you would like to be, combined with the realization that you don't need to worry about keys, you're not playing black and white notes, you will actually become a very, very honest, natural pianist. And that's a very, very good way to begin. The final thing about the mental box is self-belief. If you don't believe that your fingers already have the possibility, then you will not have the possibility. Your fingers will not provide you with that possibility. But it's not your fingers which are doing the work. It's your mind. Your fingers do not have brains in them. Your mind is where the brain is. Your fingers are just an extension of that. So what's interesting to know is that whatever you can play on the piano physically, you can actually play in your mind. But that should be said in the opposite direction. What you can play in your mind, you can play on the piano. Your fingers will conform to that. I recently read an article, and it's easy to find online, about illness and fitness. And the experiment involved three groups. One group did absolutely no exercise at all, and they lived their normal lives. And at the end of the experiment, they felt absolutely the same. The second group were told to exercise a lot, three times a day. And after the period, I think it was two weeks or three weeks, they were tested and they had gained strength. And it was about 27%. And the third group were told to just think about exercising. Now, this is a real experiment. You can find it online. 
Now, those people who only thought about exercising had an increase in strength of 24%. That's almost the same as those people that actually did the exercising physically. So that's one very strong example of the body following the mind. The body physically, physically modifies itself in some way based on the condition of the mind. And that's why this philosophy of mind, the piano, water pianism, is so heavily focused on the mind because every book and every teacher, in my experience, never discusses the mind. Everything is about the fingers, is about fingering, is about posture, is about comparisons with others, is about adhering to norms, methods are for some because they work for some people and not others. Whereas philosophy applies to everybody, because it's just one thing, the mind, a confident, self-believing mind, which takes time to play the piano in, its, in itself, on its internal piano, away from the physical piano, will produce a better pianist and a more honest pianist over someone who's only sitting at the piano and never using their mind. This is a simple fact. There is another scientific experiment which took place a few decades ago, which involved sports people. And those who physically did the sport, whose brain waves were recorded with a special machine attached to their body, when they actually did the exercise or the particular sport, jumping or throwing something, and the people who just sat down and thought about doing it, the brain waves recorded scientifically were exactly the same. The only difference is the signals being sent to the muscles to actually move the body. Now, what does that tell you? That tells you that the brain, the mind, does not know the difference between fantasy, just sitting down and thinking about it, or reality, which is actually doing it. That technically means, although it's a bit of a push to say this completely, but it goes in the direction of you can learn to play the piano without actually having a piano. So in the physical box, assuming that the mental box understands all of these concepts, the physical side of playing the piano will actually be easier Because you will naturally find your position on the piano, you'll naturally find your posture, your hands will naturally play the piano in the most natural way, without actually a lot of conscious thought. That's quite amazing, and it's quite a new idea in piano, and I hope you adopt it. By closing your eyes also, this is a physical thing, by closing your eyes, you will feel the piano. You will not have what I call conscious interference blocking you and restricting you. One of my blog articles, I put a poem which is over 100 years old. And it's basically, I can't remember it exactly because it's in very old, heavy English, but it basically says that there was a centipede walking along and a frog came to the centipede and said, how can you walk with all those 100 legs? Then you never fall over. And then the centipede lady started to, the female centipede started to think about this. That's true. How how don't I fall over with all these 100 legs moving all independently, but yet all together. And then she fell over. And that's a very clever idea. Too much thought, too much conscious interference interferes with the natural progression, natural flow, and it impedes your progress. So with a natural, still state of mind, the physical body will perform as you desire. You just have to believe that that's true because it truly, truly is. Despite box one and box two being completely connected, box three is just an ego satisfaction. You could spend a week reading every Wikipedia article about every part of musical theory. It will not change how you play the piano, and it will not change the facts that I have discussed already about the mental box. So do you want to spend time studying theory, or do you want to spend time sitting down in front of the piano but not necessarily playing it, or elsewhere, not playing the piano because you're not sitting at it, and just spend a few weeks, a few months training your mind to be patient, to not compare to others, to be trusting in itself, you have a choice. Because no amount of theory will get you to that point. It's nice to know. Theory is very useful for communication purposes. If I'm teaching or you would like to ask a question about something, of course it's necessary to be able to use words and ideas and labels. C sharp, G flat, B, you know, this chord, that chord, the fifth of this key is that, the fifth of C sharp is A sharp, you know, the minor of F is A flat. It's nice to know these things, the circle of fourths, the circle of fifths, uh, particular chord types, blue scales. It's all well and good. But as a theory, it doesn't affect the way that you play in any way whatsoever. So if you do want to learn any theory, go and learn it. It's nice to know. And then just acknowledge the fact that you know it because you're not actually going to be able to do anything with that knowledge. It's just stuff. It's just words in your mind and will not actually affect the way that you actually play the piano at all. So in conclusion of this particular podcast, acknowledge the three boxes 
mental, that must be full of concepts and notions and ideas and understandings about the piano and about the self, the musical personality. The second box is technical, it's physical. It's how your fingers are moving. They will move as they need to move. As long as the mind understands the correct concept of playing the piano. The fact that if you have a problem about something, if you have a difficult passage, you will probably not, well, it won't be very quick, overcome that difficulty if you just sit on the piano and keep doing it and doing it and doing it. Many websites, many responses on different websites, many videos teach to repeat. Sit down and repeat. Have a break, come back, sit down and repeat. That's not going to do anything. That's going to make you into a robot, into a machine. Leave the piano, even if it's a week, and just consciously imagine yourself playing that passage. You don't need to move your fingers along with it. Just consciously imagine that you're playing it, that you can play it. Don't give it the label of difficult. Don't give it the label of easy. If you do that, most people will usually always play what's easy and avoid more often than not what is difficult, which means that you won't really make any progress. You won't actually improve your technique to what it could be and what it already is, but you just haven't revealed it to yourself yet. Understand finally that the third box is only theoretical knowledge, which is words about words, and it will not have any impact on the way that you can actually play the piano. So I hope you've enjoyed this uh, little talk. Maybe I'll do more of them if people would like to ask me some questions. I'm always prepared to answer questions in a philosophical way and to give you things to think about. Uh, because as you know, the correct mental conditioning will make you the honest, purposeful, correct pianist that you actually want to be. And there's no need to compare yourself with anybody else. Thank you very much for listening. And if you'd like to subscribe to my channel, that would be most excellent. Thank you for your time and uh, bye for now.